Um, that'll be the only slide, so you'll probably get tired of it after a little while. Um, and as is my you know, requirement, even though um, most of you know I work for some organization over in Russell, and I'm required to say that uh, I'm here tonight on my own, and what I'm about to say is my own views and opinions and doesn't represent that of that organization that pays my bills. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about battle. I'm going to talk to you about uh, innovation, um, about uh, what I think is, uh, um, and I'm going to be very bold here, perhaps the most significant innovation of the First World War on the uh, Western Front, and the key innovation that is responsible for restoring maneuver mobility in 1918. Um, and that innovation is bringing together artillery fire with intelligence and creating uh, modern war's first intelligence fusion cell, might be what we would call it today, and using the results of that um, in fire plans similar to what Roger was showing you um, in 1917 and 1918. And this was something that wasn't, hadn't been done before. Now, um, innovation, you know, usually requires a problem. You don't innovate just because you feel like innovating. Um, usually something has to motivate you to do it. And, on, and that, in the First World War on the Western Front, that was, uh, you know, that problem was uh, the defensive fire that swept no man's land and prevented maneuver of the forces to close with and defeat the enemy. Now, the generals who uh, commanded you know, were not surprised by this defensive fire. It was a problem that was first clearly identified um, in around 1880, and they thought about how to get through this, how to solve the problem of defensive fire. And they weren't able to, even with the lessons of the Russo-Japanese War, the Balkan Wars, or even the Boer War in South Africa. So, the problem is getting across no man's land. And various technologies will be invented, like the tank, um, that will enable the maneuver, <coughs> mobil mobility to be restored in 1918. But the one that I'm going to talk to you about, this artillery intelligence fusion cell, was called the Counter Battery Staff Office. It's a British Army um, invention, although the French Army is doing very similar work in coming up with their own solution that is you know, very similar to the British one. The point where they get serious about raising the Counter Battery Staff Office is after the, or during the Battle of the Somme. That initial day, that shock of nearly 20,000 fatalities, just British fatalities, that is, and the ongoing slaughter of that campaign, um, brought together so that by the end of the battle, the genesis of the Counter Battery Staff Office is, is, is there. And by the end of 1916, the first one is already operating. And by early in 1917, they, every corps in the British Army, 18 of them, or by the end of the war, there are 18, is operating their own CBSO. Now, what did it consist of? Well, first off, like, like most intelligence organizations, it's pretty small, uh, maybe a dozen people under the command of a lieutenant colonel who reported to the uh, general officer commanding the Royal Artillery. So they're a core level asset. Maybe 12 people, combination of artillery, you know, gunners, um, intelligence officers, and survey people, um, and then just a few other ranks to do admin, um, copying, and those kinds of tasks. It's important to understand that they did not command. They did not own anything. But since they worked closely with the, um, the GOCRA, they almost had his authority. And so within the core um, area, they had access to all the assets they required to gather the intelligence they needed and come up with their fire plans. So 
you know, what were those tools? Well, it's a whole series of, of not only, not just new, not, not all of them are new, but ones that are now being brought together and somebody realizing the implications of these technologies and how they can be used, such as you know, sound ranging you know, by the Royal Engineers, um, flash spotting, aerial observation via you know, either aircraft or balloons, um, prisoner interrogation, all providing information. So those things that today we would call them the, you know, sensors. Right? So they would gather all this information in, and the staff of the CBSO would then analyze this information and figure out where the German guns were located, which means simply a plotting exercise, you know, a series of triangulations, lots of math, to figure out exactly where the enemy's guns. And every time the enemy fired, it would reveal a location. And sometimes these locations would change as the enemy moved the guns around. And they would have to keep confirming and plotting and continue to maintain uh, visibility of where the enemy's guns were. So that's the intelligence coming in. But it was also aided by things, and, and Roger mentioned them, calibration and meteorology, which improved the accuracy of fire. And it also assisted by gas, uh, the use of the gas shell, which comes into its own in counter battery fire. Because it, one of the realizations they make is that they don't have to destroy the enemy's guns, which is a very hard thing to do. You just need to neutralize them. Now, I'm assuming that many of you are in the military or were in the military. And so you would know how uncomfortable it is to you know, go about your business wearing modern count, uh, chemical uh, suits and, and, and gas masks. Well, the design of the German gas mask um, made any kind of heavy work extremely difficult, almost prohibitively so. So, and of course, loading shells into a gun, that's pretty heavy, heavy duty work. And so if you could get gas on target, that gun pretty much wouldn't be able to operate, even if the gun has got their masks on in time. So gather the intelligence, plot where the positions of the enemy are, and then incorporate that information into a counter-battery fire plan that the CBSO would bring, draw up. And they had access, and just like Roger, you know, borrow Roger's you know, list of all those heavy um, uh, artillery groups, um, each corps, they would be allocated those assets and they would provide the fire plan to those counter-battery guns within their, within their core. And then at the moment of um, an operation, an offensive, the counter-battery guns would attempt to neutralize the enemy's guns. So using the same weapon to take the enemy's firepower out of the equation, and thereby making it possible to get across no man's land. So a system emerges combining you know, tanks to crush the wire, rolling barrages to take out the machine guns, and the counter battery fire to neutralize the enemy's defensive fire, which greatly reduces the, the lead that is sweeping no man's land, doesn't make it empty of lead, but reduces it significantly so that enough troops can get across and close with the enemy. Now these results in, uh, in 1917, they start using this system and it's um, at you know, Vimy Ridge, Messines, it's part of the contribution to the success of those battles. But it's the system that is evolving and by 1918 it's now a mature system. So, you know, after the German offenses um, at the beginning of the year have, uh, have uh, ended, the first real 1918 test of it is, is at Hamel, uh, the Australian battle. And the German guns are virtually silent, enabling the Australians to get across no man's land, secure their objectives at very little cost, or relatively little cost. But the big test, of course, is in August at the Battle of Amiens, 
uh, that great offensive. And at that point, the British, the counter-battery staff officers that were involved, had identified the positions of about 85% of the German batteries. And pretty much all of them were silenced at the start of the operation. And of course, that's what Ludendorff calls the blackest day of the war. Um, but it was also the start of a series of relentless blows that would drive the Germans back um, under combined French, British, American offenses, for which they were unable to stem. Now, the CBSL was not perfect. It had limitations. And it was optimally designed for a relatively stagnant front, because it took about four or five days, or even maybe a week, to start to get a handle of where the Germans' locations of the batteries were. So it was not designed for mobile warfare. So even when the, uh, later into 1918, when the front starts to shift more rapidly, um, as the shift front moved, they could not keep up. But then when the Germans would dig in again, they would come forward, engineers would lay out their sound listening devices, flash spotters would go into action, intelligence would start, you know, continue to come into the CBSO office, and it would then start plotting the batteries again. And of course, it required you know, gas, because you know, uh, gas was ideal for the achievement of neutralization. Now, um, I'm a slightly sort of you know, unusual historian uh, in that I spend a lot of my time thinking about the future. And one of the things that I've been aware of and one of the things that I've been studying is that I think we're back in 1880. And we're facing very similar problems going forward um, into the, the future character of, of wars that may uh, come uh, uh, again. And we actually, again, once again, are seeing the emergence of new no man's lands. But with a combination of improving precision, improving sensors, no man's lands that now exist that can extend out to you know, 2,000 kilometers, theater level size. And if you put things like cyber into that too, then the target or the theater is now global. And these weapons will continue to gain in precision and range. And so contemporary commanders are starting to face these same situations again. And at the moment, they don't really have any answers about how do you maneuver across a no man's land of high lethality, but which is now theater level size. Um, and hopefully, that if this occasion when you need to do that ever arises, and hopefully it doesn't, but if it does arise, hopefully the commanders of today can do better than those of, of the 1880s, and we don't have to wait through three years of the Western Front before a solution is again found. But I suspect the CBSO can illustrate part of the way forward, and in part, help to unlock the future requirements. Um, I think I'm actually a few minutes early, but that's fine, and I look forward to your questions later. <laughs>